Welcome everyone to our solar photovoltaic course. Today we have 6th week and 4th module. So far we are discussing about perovskite solar cell and very important category of third generation solar cell. We have discussed that the charge carrier dynamics and morphology plays a very important role in determining the efficiency of this kind of solar cell. Now we have also seen that uh, the perovskite solar cell with a very short span of research has increased its efficiency starting from 3.8 percent to almost about 22 percent. But still we do not see lot of perovskite solar module in the market. So, what can be the reason behind is that? Now, for any technology to become commercially successful, there are lot of aspect has to be optimized simultaneously. For example, like for photovoltaics or solar cell technology also, the efficiency is not the only parameter as far as the commercialization is concerned. Of course, we need a highly efficient solar cell, but the solar cell also has to work in an environmental condition. We usually install the solar module in the rooftop. So, that means and especially for a country like India where we have so much temperature variation in a single place. If you take up for example, Delhi, so in hot summer it can goes up to 40 to 45 degree Celsius and in winter it can go even to 0 degree Celsius. So, the solar cell module has to undergo this huge temperature difference. Now, we have seen that the temperature affects the current density, especially the short circuit current density. So, because of that the efficiency of the solar cells will also vary and also there are some material since these are also the organic based materials, some materials also undergo thermal degradation. So, now because of this huge temperature variations, so there is a probability that these materials can undergo a thermal degradation. On top of that for same example, in our country we have a huge humidity variation. We can go to a place where we have 80 to 90 percent humidity or there are places where the humidity level is very, very low 20 to 30 percent or 40 percent even. So, the installed solar module has to undergo this huge humidity variations and in principle it should preserve the efficiency intact over this humidity scale. So, uh, what the means of all of this is that when we design a solar panel or a solar module in addition to the efficiency thermal degradation, humidity induced degradations and the intrinsic degradations these are all the parameters needs to be simultaneously optimized before bringing the solar panels for any commercial or practical applications. Now, the silicon is a time tested technology over and over we have seen that the silicon solar panels are there for quite a long time and it successfully keeps its efficiency and its performance is quite stable. For organic solar cell the efficiency is not as high as silicon solar cell like in a module we get 4 to 6 percent efficiency in an organic P3 HT PCBM solar cell usually you can say 4 percent efficiency. So, the efficiency wise it cannot compete with the silicon solar cell. But when you talk about the perovskite solar cell efficiency is not an issue. You can still get an efficiency which is comparable to the silicon solar cell and sometimes it is higher than that. But the question is one of the major problem with the perovskite as you mentioned in the last class also one of them is the toxicity due to the lead. We have seen that most of this organic inorganic perovskite material they use lead as one of the ingredient and lead is a very known neurotoxic and nephrotoxic material. So, we wanted to replace the lead with non lead compound, but when we replace the lead with non lead compound the stability of the compound increase, but we get compromised in the efficiency parameter. 
So, the second parameter which is extremely important in terms of the perovskite is the stability. Now, of course, we have the environmental degradation like degradation due to the thermal variations or humidity variations, but moreover the most important thing is that the instability of these devices. Perovskite materials are intrinsic instable by the photo exposure, a fact commonly known as the ion migration. So, unless until we address all these issues, we come across with a solution to protect the material against the thermal degradation, the humidity induced degradations or even if we can slow down the ion migration, we cannot make a good stable perovskite devices. So, today's lecture we will discuss about all the stability issue and at the end we will see that what are the solutions for the stability issues. Okay, Let us take a look on that. So, stability issues organic inorganic metal halide perovskite solar cells usually represented by methyl ammonium lead triiodide. Now, I have talked in the last class that this methyl ammonium this is an organic cation which is sometimes written as MA and then the iodide this is the halogen compound and lead is the metal cation. Now, this organic inorganic MAPBI 3 that has witnessed great achievement since the first demonstration of perovskite solar cell in 2009. The certified power conversion efficiency has raised from 14.1 percent to 23.3 percent within a few years which is the fastest growing photovoltaic technology in history. So, from 14.1 percent to 23.3 percent in a very short amount of research activities or in a very small span of time. So, that is the huge growth potential yeah, and also you know, one important thing uh, one should know that when I say that it is a certified efficiency. Now, who uh, gives the certification? So, uh, basically uh, the, there is an association called National Renewable Energy Laboratory NREL in USA which accredite or which certify the power conversion efficiency of the solar cell. So, whenever we make a new kind of solar cell or high efficient solar cell we usually send to them and then they independently test that things and then they put a stamp or like you know accredit or certify the efficiency number. Besides the efficiency lifetime of stability and cost that is the golden triangle are considered to gauge the technical feasibility for commercializations of PV technologies. So, uh, whenever as I said that whenever uh, you want to bring a technology in the market. So, there are three things has to be considered. Now, for photovoltaic industry these three things are one is the efficiency, another is the lifetime or stability and another is the cost and these three parameters they form a triangle it is called a golden triangle and each of these parameter is dependent on others. So, we have to optimize each of the parameter individually to get the maximum output from this photovoltaic solar cell. So, more than 90 percent of the current market share of the commercialized PVs is taken by silicon PV because it delivers a package of decent module efficiency of 21 percent, long lifetime of more than 25 years and low cost of 0.3 dollar per watt that is reaching the grid parity. So, uh, when you use a silicon solar panel, so it not only gives a high efficiency, but it lifetimes is also very high 25 years. Once you install it in your rooftop, so we do not have to be uh, concerned about for the next 25 years. And also because of the continuous research, this is a very mature technology. The cost is somewhat around 0.3 dollar per watt. In comparison, perovskite single cells hold promise because of their efficiency reaching 23 percent and above and low manufacturing cost which has been estimated to be able to reach the half of the crystalline silicon. However, the stability of the perovskite solar cell is quite problematic. So, far the longest lifetime reported for the PSC is about 1 year which is much shorter than the 25 years as expected from the commercialized PV technology. Okay, now, again like you know if you talk about this golden triangle efficiency, cost and stability. So, perovskite 
has efficiency which is comparable to the silicon solar cell 23 percent. It cost is much lower than the silicon solar cell, but if you think about the lifetime of the stability where a silicon solar cell can run up to 25 years, a perovskite solar cell can run for 20 for only 1 years. So, it cannot beat in terms of the stability or lifetime to the silicon, but as I said that one has to modify these 3 parameters simultaneously to get a good technology. So, uh, you look at this golden triangle in this figure, so there are this efficiency parameters and then there are this lifetime of the stability and then there is this cost. So, this is this is uh, one of the parameters is dependent on others and this triangle is called a golden triangle solar performance golden triangle. So, uh, the importance of this triangle is that each of the parameter determines the other. For example, like a solar cell an unknown solar cell let us say we have designed which has an efficiency of very high efficiency something like let us say 20 percent, but it lifetimes is only 2 years while the cost is also very low. But still this is not a very successful technology because at least the installed solar panel has to run for another 20 to 25 years, people do not want to invest the money every time. So, the lifetime or the stability of the device should be also be very high in addition to the efficiency and as well as the low cost. So, this triangle is very very important when designing a solar module. Now, if you take a uh, look of the different uh, varieties of the silicon solar cell and perovskite solar cell and if you compare uh, this the 3 parameters of the golden triangle for the silicon and perovskite, we can see this histogram. So, uh, in terms of the cost you see that the silicon solar cell the cost is 0.3 dollar per watt. Now, this dollar rate is changing every day let us say today it is like you know uh, 1 dollar is 71 rupees. So, 0 0.30 dollar you can calculate. So, it is almost about 2 to 2.5 rupees and this number is I mean because of the market fluctuation that changes. But PVSK or the perovskite solar cell the cost is half of the silicon solar cell. So, if I can if I have to buy uh, 1 watt power at 2 rupees in silicon I can buy at 1 rupees by perovskite solar cell. So, this is very very good news you look at the efficiency silicon solar cell the histogram it is showing that the efficiency can go up to 26.6 percent also uh, although when you make a module the efficiency decrease somewhere around like 20 21 percent MR for a silicon solar cell routinely gives 15 to 16 percent. For a perovskite solar cell the efficiency number is all, almost comparable 23.3 percent. So, it is not bad. So, efficiency wise perovskite solar cell and silicon solar cell are comparable cost wise perovskite solar cell can beat silicon solar cell. But what about the lifetime the third parameter you see the comparison between the two histogram silicon solar cell can last for 25 years once installed where the perovskite solar cell the lifetime is only one year. So, this is way less than the silicon solar cell. So, although we gain in terms of cost and comparable efficiency, but we lose significantly in terms of the stability. So, that is why major research is now focused so that this histogram can be increased so that we can get a higher lifetime or higher stability as comparable to the silicon. Then this technology is almost comparable to the silicon solar cell technology. Now, this is a very important feature so, when I talk about the lifetime of stability. So, lifetime of the stability of a device comes into two different areas. One is that once I make a solar panel or let us say I make a solar module to prevent the environmental degradation like thermal degradation or humidity degradation I can put a layer of encapsulant or barrier layer and that very well can take care for the environmental degradation. But what about the material intrinsic properties? If I have a material which undergoes spontaneous degradations under sunlight then how can we arrest that or how can I inhibit that? So, that is the intrinsic photo instability of the materials. So, the major problem with the perovskite is that perovskite shows an intrinsic photo instability an effect called ion migration. So, we will look into all those parameters which contribute to the ion migration and the thermal instability as well as the humidity instability. Now, to understand this thing 
we have to understand the material properties. So, as we mentioned again and again that the efficiency in a solar cell is a product function. It depends upon 4 5 different parameters simultaneously. It depends upon the exciton generation, it depends upon exciton diffusion, exciton dissociation as well as charge carrier collection. Now, these two parameters exciton diffusion and exciton dissociation that is very much related to the morphology of the solar cell. If I have an optimum morphology, then we will get a very good exciton dissociation. Now, this term morphology is very different in terms of the organic solar cell and perovskite solar cell. In organic solar cell, we have seen that by an optimized morphology, we mean a bicontinuous phase separated percolated network. In a perovskite solar cell, we need a uniform pinhole free or crack free continuous thin film because here we do not have the exciton, but we have the free charge carriers here. If we have a very good morphology, then we can control the charge carrier dynamics somehow. So, basically all the things comes about the controlling the morphology or the morphology optimizations to get a better stable perovskite solar cell. The stability or lifetime of perovskite solar cell is affected by many factors as you mentioned, which can be classified into two categories. One is extrinsic or environmental like temperature, humidity or moisture and another is the intrinsic factors. If the material is such that it undergoes spontaneous disintegration under the sunlight, then that is the intrinsic factor. Environmental factors such as moisture and oxygen can be settled by encapsulation. That is what we mentioned that most of the cost in the solar cell technology goes for the encapsulation or the making barrier layers. So, the effect of the moisture and the oxygen can be taken care by encapsulation and the most critical issues are due to the intrinsic instability of the bulk perovskite material and the interface between the perovskite and the charge transport layer. So, uh, there are two aspects in this thing. One is the bulk perovskite material, another is the interface. So, whenever you make a, a perovskite solar cell, so we usually put an electron transport layer or hole transport layer before the metal electrode or the ITO substrate. Now, the interface between perovskite and the charge transport layer that plays a very important role also to determine its intrinsic stability. There are three main intrinsic factors leading to the perovskite instability, hygroscopicity, thermal instability and ion migration. The hygroscopicity is related to the environmental factors and con can also be solved by encapsulation. The thermal instability can be addressed by compositional tuning to increase the decomposition energy or barrier as for example, with a F A cation. So, what does it means? Like we have seen that uh, when we fabricate the perovskite solar cell, what materials we use there? We said that a very commonly used perovskite material for fabricating solar cell is CH 3, NH 3, lead iodide and we say that this organic cation that is also called MA. Now, this MA cation has a particular cationic radius. Instead of this CH3 NH3, if we use CH3 CH2 NH2, or if I if I increase, if I use a larger cation, if I increase the cationic diameter of the MA, for example, if we use a formaldehyde cation, which is also abbreviated as FA, then due to the steric hindrance, the decomposition energy or the thermal stability will be changed. So, uh, for example, let us say I have a very viscous liquid in a, in a jar or in a glass. Now, I dipped a small metal ball and in the other case, I dipped a very large metal ball. So, obviously, the motion of the large metal ball and the small metal ball will be completely different. The large metal ball will experience more drag. So, similarly, if we increase the diameter of the organic cations. So, it feels because of its mass more steric obstacle or steric, steric hindrance and because of that it cannot move or migrate spontaneously like a smaller cation. So, but then I mean one might ask the question if we keep on increasing the diameter of the organic cation then this problem is solved. No, we cannot do it because we know that to get a perovskite crystal structure, we need to satisfy certain stoichiometric ratio 
is called tolerance factor. Tolerance factor is the ratio of the cation and anionic radius and it gives a particular kind of crystal structure, a crystal structure necessary for the charge transport. So, if we keep on increasing the cationic radius, we will destroy the tolerance factor, we will not get the desired perovskite crystal structure. So, keeping the tolerance factor in the mind, we can increase the cation. The ion migration is almost unavoidable in all halide perovskites due to the high external field applied across the thin films during the JV scan and the high ionic mobility and the situation is worse at the defective sites, grain boundaries and the interface. Now, the ion migration that is a very intrinsic properties and when we measure the solar cell efficiency like when we do the IV scan usually we apply a bias. So, whenever we apply a bias, so if there are ions are there, so those ions have some mobility. So, this, this ions start moving alongside the crystal. Similarly, if there are some trap state or defective sites, if there are lot of grain boundaries, the boundary between the two grains, if there are lot of grain boundaries like that and if there are some lot of interface inside the crystals. So, those all actually is a potential energy many minima and they acts like a trap states. So, whenever the ion can goes and then go and trap there, so that can inhibit the JSC value. The issue of ion migration is currently treated by A site alkyl doping and replacement, multiple dimensional perovskite engineering and organic molecular additives. So, either by adding an organic molecules or by alkyl doping or multiple dimension perovskite engineering, one can address this stability issue. The best lifetime obtained for perovskite solar cell is 10,000 hour, is 10,000 hour around 1 year. But the PC is only about 12 percent. If we set an efficiency threshold of 20 percent, the best light soaking stability is only 1000 hour. So, with a 12 percent efficiency, they can keep one year, but if we put the target as 20 percent, the lifetime is only 1000 hour. So, again that golden triangle cost, efficiency and lifetime or stability. Currently, the device efficiency and stability are not simultaneously optimized, but there is no principle of physics prohibiting the achievement of both high efficiency and high stability in PSC. Research interest on the stability studies is growing rapidly to resolve the stability problem for perovskite solar cells. So, uh, there is no thermodynamic limit, there is no fundamental physics problem that we cannot optimize the efficiency and the stability at the same time scale. So, we need to do more research to understand what is the source of the instability so that we can address that by material science or by suitable engineering of the materials properties and we can achieve the high efficiency and the high stability at the same time. And that is why a lot of nowadays research is driven for making a high efficiency as well as highly stable perovskite solar cell. While addressing the stability issues in perovskite solar cell, the one first important aspect is the chemical instability is one of the most important factors that leads to the degradation of perovskite. Some important factors associated to chemical disintegration of perovskites are mentioned. So, in this successive reactions, we are talking about how the perovskite material undergoes the different kind of disintegration materials. During the process of assembly and testing, oxygen and moisture in the atmosphere can directly affect the stability of the components in perovskite. First, due to the high sensitivity of CH3 NH3 lead iodide to water, it tends to hydrolyze in the presence of moisture, leading to the degradation of perovskite, which can be formalized by the following reaction mechanism. Let us say I have a CH3 NH3 lead iodide, which is a solid compound, A stands for the solid. Now, what it will do? It will absorb the water H2O and it will disintegrate to lead iodide plus CH3 NH3 I which is a solid which is a aqueous medium. Now, this aqueous CH3 NH3 I, so that undergoes a disintegration to CH3 NH2 in aqueous material plus hydroiodic acid, this is also aqueous. Now, this hydroiodic acid they reacts with the oxygens to get iodine and water and the hydroiodic acid can also disintegrate itself to hydrogen and iodide. 
So, uh, whenever this CH3 NH3I which is a solid compound it, it looks at the moisture or when it sees the moisture of the water vapor it disintegrates to lead iodide and CH3 NH3I. CH3 NH3I now disintegrate to CH3 NH2 plus HI. HI in the presence of oxygen makes I2 plus H2O and HI disintegrates to hydrogen and iodine. It should be noted that the moisture, oxygen and UV radiation are indispensable for the degradation process. Additionally, the equilibrium of reaction leads to the coexistence of CH3NH3I, CH3NH2 and HI in the films. So, basically when I expose the film to the moisture, we get both CH3NH3I, CH3NH2 and HI in the film. So, the, the 3D structure has now disintegrates to its individual components. There are two methods for HI to degrade in the next step. One method is a redox reaction in the presence of the oxygens. So, HI can react in the presence of the oxygens. The other method is a photochemical reaction in which HI can decompose into H2 and I2 under UV radiation. So, now when you scan the solar cell, you have to scan all the wavelength. Now, when I scan that, then it is also exposed to the UV light. Now, the UV light can degrade the HI to the hydrogen and iodine, this is a photochemical reaction. Now, the consumption of HI according to the reaction 2C and 2D drives the whole degradation process forward. Now, once the HI has been degraded either to H and I or HI has been oxidized in the presence of the oxygen, then the whole kinetics moves towards the right and it actually leads to the further disintegration of the perovskite material. As the degradation of organic inorganic halide perovskite is quite sensitive to the moisture and oxygen, most of the fabrication process must be conducted in a globe box filled with inert gas. Now, what is a globe box? A globe box is an environmental chamber where you can control the humidity level and oxygen level. So, since the perovskite material is very very sensitive to the moisture level or the humidity level, so we or the water contact, so we have to fabricate the device in a control environment away from like you know water vapor or away from any kind of moisture. So, that is done by fabricating the perovskite solar cell in a globe box. But again the problem is that once we make it in a globe box, then what will happen when I bring it outside? Again it will can undergo the similar kind of degradation kinetics. Here oxygen together with the moisture could lead to the irreversible degradation of the CH3 NH3 lead iodide according to the reaction 2 A and 2 2 D. So, we have both oxygen, we have both moisture. So, if I have both moisture and oxygen, you see that the CH3 NH3I finally disintegrate to hydrogen, iodine, some CH3 NH3I, HI, all this compound. And sometimes, if both of them are present, then this reaction is irreversible. This reaction is irreversible degradation. The color change of CH3 NH3I under different conditions demonstrated that only air and UV radiation could lead to the brown color which is due to the existence of the iodine. So, when you expose a CH3 NH3 lead iodide film to the ambient condition for quite a some time, you will see the black color film has been converted to brown color and that is because we have iodine in the system now. Because of the iodine, the film has been converted to the black color to the brown color. So, it is no longer a perovskite crystal structure now. In perovskite solar cell, the most commonly used photo anodes are composed of compact or mesoporous TiO2. So, as we have uh, learnt earlier, that we can make the perovskite solar cell either in a PIN geometry or in a NIP geometry. We call them as a forward or, or an inverted. So, in a PIN geometry, we put P dot PSS on top of the ITO substrate and we put some spiroometed or doped spiroometed on the top surface of the perovskite before metal contact. But in an NIP geometry, we put titanium dioxide, mesoporous titanium dioxide or compact titanium dioxide as a N layer on top of the ITO and we put some whole transport material like P3HT on the top as a whole transport material. Now, the photo anode composed of the mesoporous TiO2 layer, titanium dioxide which has a band gap of 3.2 electron volt is a typical photo catalyst for oxidizing water to create hydroxy radicals and for oxidizing organic molecules. It was found that after light exposure for 12 hour, the original CH3 NH3 lead iodide layer was transformed into lead iodide as evidenced by the decreased UV absorption and XRD patterns. So, if you look at the in situ XRD patterns in the presence of moisture, you will see that 
gradually C H 3 N H 3 lead iodide structure is disintegrating into the lead iodide structure. They proposed a possible mechanism to explain the degradation process in the film under light exposure as follows. See we have the iodine, iodine 2 I minus it can goes to I 2 plus 2 electron at the interface between T I O 2 and C H 3 N H 3 I. So, basically we are now probing the interface between the mesoporous titanium dioxide and the perovskite active layer. So, at the interface, so we have now the iodine plus 2 electron because T i o 2 actually acts like a as we said here is a photo catalyst. It can oxidize water to create hydroxy radicals and oxidizing organic materials. Now, this C H 3 N H 3 they further degrades to the C H 3 N H 2 and 3 H plus. This 3 H plus in the presence of the electron and iodine they makes 3 iodide. So, C H 3 N H 3 that decompose into C H 3 N H 2 plus 3 H plus proton and that proton further, further reacts with this iodine, this iodine to make the 3 iodine H i. First, TiO 2 extract electrons from iodine and deconstruct the structure of the perovskite leading to the formations of the iodine. So, uh, TiO 2 is, an, is a very known or good electron extractor. So, it extracts the electron from iodine and deconstructs the structure of the perovskite leading to the formation of iodine. Then the continuous elimination of H plus through reaction and evaporation of CH3 NH2 drives the reaction forward. Finally, extracted electrons at the interface between TiO2 and CH3 NH3 lead iodide can return to reduce iodine and the formed HI can easily evaporate due to its low boiling point. In order to improve the stability of the perovskite under light exposure, SB2 S3 was inserted at the interface between mesoporous TiO2 and CH3 NH3 lead iodide. You look at the degradation scheme of CH3 NH3 lead iodide during UV light exposure. So, what will happen? So, at the interface we have the TiO2 and we have this CH3 NH3 lead iodide, right? This CH3 NH3 lead iodide and TiO2. Now, light generates, now light falls on the TiO2. So, when light falls on the TiO2, so, what will happen? TiO2 can grab the electron. So, what happens? Now, the iodine, the 2 I minus. So, in the presence of the TiO2, now can convert it to the iodine I2. Now, this TiO2, so what they do? So, if they grabs the electron, now we have the proton here. So, this proton reacts with the 3 CH3 NH2 and it makes the cation CH3 NH3 plus and we generate. 3 H i, but what will happen like you know here overnight. So, T i o 2 if you if you leave it something like that. So, it will disintegrate to two components one is 3 C H 3 N H 2 and another is the lead iodide and lead iodide further it will decompose to the hydroiodic acid. It will vaporize. This phenomena can be prevented if we put a layer of S B 2 S 3 a compound in between T i o 2 and C H 3 N H 3 i. What it will do? So, the electron hole pair which will be generated here, so electron will be grabbed by TiO2 and this SB2 S3 will help the hole to pass through this side. Okay? And this hole can react with the further with the electrons there, so they can prevent the degradation. So, that is why an ideal stable structure to prevent the decomposition is to put a layer of SB2 S3 in between TiO2 and CH3 NH3 layer added film. So, this is all about interface engineering. Now, the solution process provides simple and easy pro procedures for fabrication of perovskite solar cell, but in this process components from the solvents, solutes, additives or impurities may destroy the crystal structure of the perovskite. When assembled in perovskite solar cell, tertiary butyl pyridine or TVP in the whole transport material could make contact with the perovskite layer and influence the stability. So, additives in the HTM such as tertiary butyl pyridine just like in TiO2 we said about like SB2 S3 and the SB2 S3 increase the UV stability. Similarly, when you use a whole transport material if we use tertiary butyl pyridine, so that also influence the stability. So, additives in the HTM such as TVP are dangerous to the perovskite during the solvent evaporation process DMM residue can also degrade the perovskite. Moreover, PSCs are very sensitive to impurities in the solvent and solute. The slight amount of water adsorbed in the air condition will lead to the irreversible decompositions of perovskite. 
In a typical solution process for perovskite film fabrication, annealing is necessary for the formation of perovskite crystal structure. So, when we mix the lead iodide and CH3 NH3I from a DMF solvent to make a perovskite thin film, so what we do after we allow them to react each other to make a perovskite crystal structure, we have to heat them at 120 degrees Celsius and this heating process is called the annealing and the annealing gives the desired crystal structure. However, the perovskite itself and the other components may be susceptible to damage during the thermal annealing, but while you are heating it to get the desired crystal structure, you can also degrade the perovskite and its ingredients. The effects of the thermal treatment on the crystal structure, the decompositions of the perovskite and the thermal stability of the whole transport layer can be summarized as the following. First, the crystal structure stability of perovskite. Crystal and phase transition is a key physico chemical conversion process in perovskite solar cell. So, this is very very important. See, this is a physical chemical conversion. So, the structure change, they change to the phase. The crystalline phase of organic inorganic hybrid perovskite can change via its own properties and due to the environmental condition such as temperature, pressure, which directly affect the stability of the perovskite solar cell. To study the stability of ABX3 perovskite, Goldsmith proposed a tolerance factor which is defined as, we have also talked about this earlier. So, tolerance factor is the radius of the A if it plus radius of the X divided by square root of root 2 Rb radius of the B plus Rx halogen. So, in our structure C is 3, Na is 3, lead iodine right that was the our organic inorganic halide perovskite. So, what is A here? This is A. What is B here? This is B lead and what is X here? So, iodine is the X. So, basically if I wanted to write the tolerance factor for this kind of particular structure, how you will write it? So, T for this kind of MAPBI3 is radius of CH3 NH3 plus the radius of iodine divided by square root of radius of lead plus radius of iodine. So, that will give you the orthorhombic or cubic what kind of crystal structure you do. And we have seen that perovskite shows the temperature dependent crystal structure. So, what happens if you change the temperature, all of these things will will change, their relative orientation will change in apart from the factor that they can disintegrate. Here Ra, Rb and Rx are the ionic ready for the ions in the A, B and X sides respectively to form a stable perovskite structure, the size of the ionic radius is restrained by the tolerance factor. For a perfectly packed cubic perovskite structure, T value is 1 fourth to 1. Empirically for the most stable perovskite structure, T corresponds to value between 0 0.8 and 1. Once you synthesize perovskite material, then by XRD analysis or by elemental analysis or by some other advanced characterization, let us say you measure the ionic ready of the different ions or different components. From there you can calculate the tolerance factor. If the tolerance factor value is between 0 0.8 and 1, then you can say that okay, this structure is a stable crystal structure. Otherwise, you have to tune some parameter. For perovskite solar cells working under sun illumination, the temperature of the solar cell seems to be greater than the transition temperature for CH3 NH3 lead iodide. So, what is transition temperature? It is a temperature at which CH3 NH3 lead iodide disintegrates to its ingredient components. Thus, whether the phase transition can affect the performance of solar cells. The deposition method could affect the phase transition process from the tetragonal to the cubic phase. It was believed that this subtle difference in the formation process would ultimately influence the photovoltaic performance and stability of the device. The application of 2D layered perovskite materials has been considered as a promising solubility to improve the stability of perovskite solar cell. Now, instead of this 3D perovskite, people are now also talking about 2D, 3D quasi perovskite solar cell and also the 2D layered perovskite st structure. These are more stable, but the efficiency is decreased because in the 2D perovskite, the charge transport is only in one dimension. We have to have a vertical dimension charge transport also to increase the stable, to increase the efficiency. The 2D perovskite materials were prepared by the insertion of larger cations. For example, C6H5CH22NH3 plus PA plus phenyl ethyl ammonium iodide, PI plus and CH3CH2 whole 3 NH3 plus barium ion into the 3D MAPBI3 lattice. It is found that due to the hydrophobic nature of the organic spacer cation, 
in 2D perovskite it shows better stability in comparison to the 3D perovskites. So, what are the solution for moisture stability? Introduction of the hydrophobic organic cation. So, we have to put a layer of the hydrophobic organic material. The reactions between the water and MAPBI 3 can generally be explained by a series of equilibria within the PBI 2 MAI H2O system. For example, if PBI 2 and MAI 5 they react they can give to MAPBI 3, MAPBI 3 plus H2O so it can gives 5 MAPBI 3 H2O. 4 N MAPBI 3 plus N MAPBI 3 that can give H2O plus 2 N H2O 5, MA 4 PBI 6 plus 2 H2O plus 3 lead iodide, MA 4 PBI 6 2 H2O 5 PBI 2 4 MI 4 H2O 2 these are all equilibrated components and they makes this equilibria systems PBI 2 MAI H2O, these are all the intermediates products when you allow the perovskite to react with the water molecule. Apart from the thermal stability of perovskite itself, other layers in a perovskite photovoltaic device can also have a great influence on the long term performance. Spirometed based hole transport layer is widely used in perovskite, but by the annealing the crystallization and oxidation of spirometed was enhanced as expected which was beneficial for the hole transfer and transport, but after a little long period of annealing the performance and stability of the solar cells decreased. So, in conclusion. Research on the chemical stability of perovskite solar cells under different conditions has attracted increasing attention, but a basic understanding of the chemical stability, especially the thermal stability still requires further exploration effects. In order to modulate the stability of perovskite solar cells, many factors should be taken into consideration for their systematic engineering, including the composition and crystal structure designing of the perovskite, the preparation of the hole transport layer and electrode materials the thin film fabrication method, interfacial engineering, encapsulation methods, multilayer encapsulation or helmet encapsulation and the module technology. So, th there are so many factors which can affect the stability of the perovskite solar cells. It can be due to the external factors like um, moisture or temperature or it can be internal factors like ion migrations. So, we have to do lot of works uh, to address those issues either in terms of a barrier layer or encapsulant layer or either by changing the material properties or either by changing the whole transport layer or either by modifying the perovskite and the transport layer interface. And there are tremendous amount of research is nowadays ongoing to increase the stability of the perovskite alongside the efficiency. And very soon we will be come across with a perovskite solar module which will also give a high efficiency at the same time very high stability and that is our goal. So, for a reference you can look there are a lot of research paper and review papers are available in the literature. Some of them is like, like review of recent progress in chemical stability of perovskite solar cell by Lido Wang, addressing the stability of issue of perovskite solar cell for commercial applications by Jing B. Yo, recent progress on the long term stability of perovskite solar cell by Yong Chen. So, these are some of the, the excellent articles and there are a lot of number of excellent research articles and review papers you will you will search online, you can find about some basic introduction to a very in depth discussion about the stability issue in a perovskite solar cell. Thank you very much.